Welcome everyone to this Good Leadership Podcast. My name is Charles Good, your host and the president of the Institute for Management Studies. This podcast is designed to provide you with actionable insights and tools that you can use from discussing the research, stories, and background from recognized experts and practitioners to accelerate your impact in your current role. I'm glad to be joined today by John Baldoni, who is an internationally recognized keynote speaker, author of 16 books that have been translated into 10 languages, and he's also ranked globally as a top 10 leadership coach. His newest book, which is going to be released later this month, Grace Under Pressure, Leading Through Change and Crisis will likely be his next bestseller. He has also authored more than 800 leadership columns for a variety of online publications, including Forbes, Harvard Business Review, and Inc.com, to say but a few. Welcome to the program, John. Well, thank you for that warm and welcome, Charles. Uh, Always honored to be on here and with IMS. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to start this out since our topic's really going to be centered around your research around your latest book, Grace under pressure. What got you interested in this topic? Well, um, Grace Under Pressure is my third book on the topic of leadership. Um, And I have long been intrigued with the concept of grace. And what my first start exploring it in the late uh, 2019, well, I published the first book, Grace, A Leader's Guide to a, a Better Us in 2019. And I focused on grace being generosity, respect, compassion, and things like that. And then um, the book was very, uh, was you know, uh, got a lot of attention, but not great sales because people said, well, you know, it's a nice concept. Do we really need grace? Well, then came the pandemic. <laughs> so all of a sudden it shoots to the top now. So um, when I um, wanted to give grace a little bit of what I call muscle. So what do I mean by that? Explore what grace can facilitate. And I do believe it's that strength within us that facilitates what we, the buzzword would be engagement. But a better word is community. We feel that we belong. We don't all think alike. We don't all act alike, but we're part of a greater whole. And that gives us comfort. And leaders with grace are those who facilitate that connection. That's really what grace is. And for the record, I'm dealing with grace in a secular sense. Many of us know it from a faith-based tradition, but grace is really, I think, wired in our DNA for the simple reason we're wired to take care of others. You're right. And I can't agree with you more. And you mentioned that through your research, it really looks at three different things that leaders need to do to get better at performing with grace under pressure. And that's first is take care of your people. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, we're in a people, a knowledge worker uh, economy. We have been for maybe 50 years. I mean, Peter Drucker was the first that identified that concept. And so knowledge workers mean that you're using the brain power of others, be it even physical labor, but whatever. But when you're dealing with people in that kind of sense, you have to give them a reason to believe. Um, You have to give them purpose. And so when times are challenging, because the subtitle of this book is Leading Through Change and Crisis, People want to know that you are there. And we had firsthand experience of this through our pandemic. The leaders who were most evident, most present, were those that got the best results. So take care of your people is essential. And there's a few things that you mentioned within that section of of, of the book and with your research that you need to be attuned to what's happening in your organization. You need to identify challenges and opportunities, gauge the mood and the motives of people because it... You really have to get deep within this space to really show that you're really caring. And it's all about situational awareness, correct? Excellent way of putting it. And and so, yeah, it's being mindful of the present and using your presence to to engage in that. And that sense of mindfulness, as I've, I've written about in a previous book about mindfulness for a leader is developing exactly what you said, the situational awareness, what's going around us, what's happening, what's not happening, and what do I do to influence the outcome? How involved do I become? Three great questions to ask during that. What is happening? What's not happening? And how can I influence the outcome? And most leaders I find, you know, they like to share the information, but they just don't know how to share it. So what kind of tips or tools you could you give some of our leaders listening on easier ways to be able to share that information? 
That little mantra, what's happening, what's not happening, what do I do to influence the outcome? I uh, borrowed that from a military example, um, and that came from a book called Hope is Not a Method. It's been out for 25 years or so. So how do leaders share that information and make it meet and mingle throughout? Well, if there's a reluctance to it, put it on your schedule. Make sure that you will be disseminating this. And I'll say, you know, Charles, and you may agree with me in all the work that you've done is I think leaders are very good at getting the message out one time. <laughs> so it, it's it's iterating that message over and over and over again. And, you know, it's, it's maybe not new to you, but it's new to the, the audience. More importantly, it's that next thing is listen. And not listen for response, solicit feedback, meet and mingle, go out and to see what are people saying? What, and also, very important, what are they not saying? And as a leader, you have to be you know, in tune with your people so that they'll be able to speak truth to power, if you will, but also comfortable sharing the not so good things. You know, leaders can get stonewalled by no one shares bad news. And that's really on the leader because they have created an environment where people don't feel comfortable in raising things which are uh, uh, maybe perceived as negative. Well, it's building that psychological safety and trust within the organization, right? So that during those times of hardship or challenge or crisis, they've already been established. So you become more transparent. You get that that transparency with your with your individual employees as well. So they're willing to share with you that information that you need to quickly pivot and adjust the corporate objectives in those times of uncertainty. Absolutely. And, and, and in times of uncertainty, that's where people need you most. And, you know, we're all looking for um, easy answers. So, for example, in an economic downturn or unseason, people want to know, well, I still have my job. Well, you'd like to be able to go to the boss and say, well, I have my job tomorrow and next year, 10 years. And often the boss doesn't know that, but you give them straight talk. It may not be what they always want to say, but when you're straight with them, that's how you begin to build trust. And that creates that sense of community. Completely agree with you. And we'll get more into trust and community a little bit later in the conversation. But I'd like to touch on this other area that you say is essential as well, is that leaders need to take care of themselves. And I think this is often lost when you get into a crisis where leaders feel like they need to take care of everyone else and they will take the leftovers if there's anything to be left at the end of that process. Absolutely. And it's because it, th if there's anything to be shorted, the leader will short him or herself first. And while that's laudable, there's only so much you can do because if you're always giving, 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 it's burnout. And I have a section there I quote uh, Dr. Sharon Milnick, Melnick about her work with resilience. And there's our on off switch. She's a clinical psychologist. I am not. Um, and so if you're always on, you are lighting the candle basically at both ends and that's going to burn. And when you burn out, you are less effective. And usually we saw this so often with our healthcare workers and they came, you know, to uh, do battle with the disease every single day and they saw terrific tragedy, but they had to take care of themselves. And if they don't, they're less effective. And they, most importantly, they suffer too. And that's not effective for them. So you have to take self-care is important. And stress is that body's reaction to danger. So dealing with stress, dealing with it proactively is so important. And, and you mentioned some steps um, in, in the book of identifying what's triggering stress. Sometimes it's not obvious. Deal with that trigger by usually what I found and what you mentioned in the book is a very common method to use is, is just to take a deep breath and focus on your breathing to relieve some of that anxiety before you try to remove it from what's really stressing you out. Absolutely. And just labeling it as stress gives you kind of a handle on it's some stress is, is good because it, it, it improves focus and attention. But stress over time, it's, it's friction. And it's uh, just as it will, you know, brakes will wear down because they're always engaged and stuff. The human condition, we are machines, uh, if you break it, and we have our breaking points. And, uh, and if we keep going and, and don't recognize the stressors on us, be it internal, external pressures, um, usually it's a combination of many things. And as you said, um, sometimes we don't identify it. It also affects our health. And then our health suffers and the whole system breaks down and we can't be at our best. And another important aspect that I think bears mentioning that I, that I was reading in the book as well is, 
is return to work and focus on what you can do now and what you can control. Not about what you're not doing that you can't control, which causes a lot of our stressors throughout our life. You, you hit the nail on the head. And that's kind of that sense of uncertainty. I once came up with the phrase of squaring the circle. I mean, others use it. But deal with what you can deal with at that time, at that moment, and focus on that. And when you do, you can get some clarity, yes. And you can also get some accomplishments, some small wins within a sea of overwhelming change. At least you will have done what you can for yourself and for your team. You're doing your best. And recognize too that we all have limits. And, and recognizing our limits is important. It's kind of that phrase of say no so you can say yes. You can't be all things to all people. By saying no to prevents you from being overextended, but it, it enables you to say yes to things which are important. Well, and then the third step or the third part of this is, is leading under grace is preparing for the future. If you could unpack that a little bit as far as what you mean regarding that. Well, I think it's a possible, it's preparation. It's thinking that the unexpected can happen. When I'm in my coaching, I always ask senior leaders, what keeps you up at night? You know, and it's often what they don't know. It's not what they know. It's what they don't know. And so um, prepare for every eventuality but realize you're going to miss something so that it's not, you know, so that when change, excuse me, a crisis occurs, you won't be prepared for everything, but you will be prepared to do some things. You'll get things together. Um, and I once coached an individual who was, it was an IT world, and he told me about a major breakdown. First thing he did was bring all the team together, hourly updates, meetings, stuff, just chipping away at doing what they're doing. They're showing some kind of action progress. I think that's important. It's also important taking a step back of what could happen, but also how do we get out of this? What's on the other side of the wall? Leaders need to be, management is the art or the practice of looking down. In other words, uh, making sure all the pieces are fit together. Leadership is about uh, looking over the parapet. What could happen? What are the opportunities that uh, lie? We, you know, the old saying of never waste a good crisis. So and there is that potential. To how can we maximize this? But never don't short the challenges that you're facing at the time because they may not be possible. And there's interesting thing. I don't know that I talk about it this way, but we always use the same of don't quit. Well, Quitting can also be the smart thing to do. So especially if you're moving this direction, you know, the market changes, uh, another competitor comes out with a cheaper, better product. Hey, that's not our lane anymore. We'll do something different. So that's not, so quitting from there doesn't mean you're a loser. It means you're smart and choosing an alternative path. Very well said. So grace under pressure really means good leaders do those three things well. They take care of their people, they take care of themselves and they prepare for the future. But there's also, I want to go into now qualities that they really possess or qualities that are attractive that they should possess in leading better with grace under pressure and crisis. So first, since we haven't done it yet, I'd love for you to kind of define what is grace? Well, grace, as I defined in my first book on the topic is grace is the catalyst for the greater good. It facilitates our ability to connect with others on a one-on-one -on -one basis. For a leader, it facilitates that ability to build a, a, a hospitable workplace where people feel that they belong. Psychological safety is an imperative. But delving more deeply as I think about grace, and this is where the, really why I wrote the book, when a grace under pressure, what do leaders do when the heat's on, is give people a reason to believe in the organization, yes, but it's look at grace as a facilitator for what? Kindness, generosity, compassion, courage, and all of those things. And of those, one of my favorites is the concept of compassion. We talk a lot about leadership, uh, or excuse me, leaders need to be empathetic. Yes, but empathetic is the ability to feel one's pain. That's for starters. What leaders do is express that empathy. What am I going to do about it? It's compassion. And looking at the other individual, other individuals as people, and what can we do to help the situation? I mean, it simply is be more productive, but also a more hospitable, a more kind, a kinder, a more generous, uh, and a more generative workplace. 
Well, since you mentioned that, why don't we go into that? Because everyone says you need to lead with empathy. And you're right. Um, you know, it's different than sympathy. But feeling empathy is not enough. You need to act with empathy. So I'd love for you to kind of differentiate those two and give maybe some tips on, on how do we do that? Well, whenever we say, when I always say uh, compassion, I always come to the historical model. One of my favorite presidents, if not the favorite, most favorite was uh, Abraham Lincoln. And I mean, he led America when we had split apart. And so there's so many stories of him being compassionate, visiting the troops, being there for others. Uh, you know, he suffered greatly himself. He lost his son when he was in the White House. He had trouble with his wife, who probably later suffered from what we would call mental illness. He probably uh, discovered, uh, suffered from depression, and sh she may have done later. But he was uh, always reaching out. He was noted for his stories. Very, very many of them are humorous. But simply that common touch, that ability, and of course, you know, he stood up for, um, made uh, in the uh, Civil War, the cause was he made it the ending slavery. It's not just the Union, but it was also ending slavery, which was a form of compassion of treating others as human beings. So leading leaders must do more than, than just to feel empathy. They must express it, and that outward expression of empathy is, is compassion, and and ways that you mentioned, which I think are, you know, three great steps in doing that is listen intently. Uh, yes. And this is a lesson I learned from Father Greg Boyle, who uh, founded and runs the um, Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. It's the la largest gang intervention program basically in the world. And it attracts um, members, boys and girls who have and matriculate to young people who leave a gang. Why did they join a gang in the first place? A sense of community because they had no home life or no sustainable home life. Uh, and so they're searching for something else, a community. And connection is important to the work that Father G does. And also this kind of, when you think of connection, it's occupying the space of another in a unobtrusive way. So if I sense, and leaders can do this, if I sense someone is experiencing a difficulty, what I don't want to do is if I go up to you and say, Charles, here's the three things you need to do. Boom, 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 boom. If we're in a business situation and we're time pressed, I might just give you that for stuff. But if you're dealing with a personal crisis, I can't. I mean, that's telling you. So how about we have a lunch together? How about you just share a park bench or whatever it is? We occupy that space and we have a conversation. And then, you know, um, you share something that's going on. And I say, would you like a perspective on that? So we have a conversation. And then, you know, here's a suggestion. And it's a back and forth. But it's that connection. That's a form of, uh, of compassion. But compassion, I think, is, you rightly hit it. it. It begins with listening. It's looking as the, at the other with a sense of respect, an open heart. Uh, what can I do? And what do I have resources to enable? Wonderful. Thank you for providing that. So let's talk about some more of those values that we need now more than ever. And the next one is courage. It's the ability to remain resolute in the face of crisis, show bravery and persevere through adversity. You know, doing so with grace under pressure is a mark of leadership that encourages others to follow you. I'm sure there's a great story you can think of or just unpack that term a little bit just to kind of give more points about it. Because in the book, you talk about the profiles and courage and you talk about John F. Kennedy when he was a senator. And now he demonstrated his courage by the way he acted during that period of time. Well, yeah. And I think what's important about Kennedy was, and he said something about courage being, it's not so much the heroic act. And he himself was very much a hero in the Second World War. His boat was shot out from under him and he swam out in the middle of a current, shark infested current three nights in a row to try to get uh, help, which eventually did come. But he, as a result of that thing and other health issues, he was in constant pain himself. So he talked about courage being the ability to deal with everyday crises or pain or whatever it is. And we all said that courage is the ability to manage fear. Many have said that. John McCain, President Roosevelt said the same kind of thing. But it's a recognition that we are maybe frail human creatures because we experience fear, not that that's a negative, but we're not frail. We don't break. We can be brave. 
And from a leadership standpoint, you need to stand up for what may, uh, what is important and uh, what's important to the organization. This comes into the idea of DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, being the voice for them, being a sponsor for others, for if you're a man, for women, or for people uh, unrepresented in the organization. And I love the concept of sponsorship being the sense of talking about them when they're not in the room, not gossip, but saying, you know, that Charles shows potential or Shirley took this and did this. She has what it takes to move on to the next level. Sponsoring people, being there uh, over and above, being their champion. That is a form of exerting courage. It's kind of breaking the norm and standing up for what can be done. Let's move to another um, trade that really is desirable for leaders. That's really probably overdone this buzzword and it's so saturating the market since the pandemic and that's resilient. Now it's become a watchword when we experience any kind of crisis. Now, I think more than ever, I know that when the crisis, when the pandemic first started, everyone was putting out articles, webinars, trainings about how to become more resilient. You mentioned a great example of Theodore Roosevelt in your book who lost his first wife, um, but challenged that his feelings and, 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 and process the loss to integrate it into their life and become stronger as a result of it, to be able to come back and rise again. What are some other examples or what are some ways rather that you could um, develop that in yourself through what we just went through for the last three right. years? Well, I have learned it. Um, I learned this from Eileen McDarg, whom I'm sure you know her work, and she writes on resilience and teaches it. And she talks about resilience as I've always thought it was getting knocked down and getting back up again, which it is. But it's also you're coming back transformed by the adversity into a different sphere. And so the world has changed. And we all saw this, and certainly with the pandemic. Um, I've had on, on my show, Grace Under Pressure, which is a show I do weekly on uh, LinkedIn Live, is I've had the opportunity of speaking to members uh, from special forces. Now they train in extreme conditions. Why? Because when they are in a conflict zone, will they experience fear? Yes, but their training takes over. So they have become more resilient through their training. The other thing is, is just as we see with Navy SEALs or special, uh, special forces people, leader, resilience can be taught. And I think leaders are missing opportunities in times of crisis if they don't share those lessons. And so sharing those lessons, here's what we're doing. Here was the adversity. Here's how we did it. Call out people for what they did, for identifying the problem, like coming up with solutions, and how can we do it better the next time? That is fostering a culture of resilience. And so that's in critical to any organization which is going to grow and, and prosper. So it's not just the ability for yourself to manage resilience, but from a leadership standpoint, teach it to others. And be the exemplar of that uh, resilience to show how resilient you can be, especially in moments of extreme tension. And I think it's also helpful to know that even though you're trained in it, you've prepared for it, the fear doesn't dissipate. You simply manage it better, right? Absolutely. I think it was John McCain that once said that only a fool doesn't experience uh, fear on the battlefield and you don't want to be around a fool. And But it's the management of fear. Absolutely. And it's fear is inherent in us. And that's why we survived as a species, because a predator came and we went, ran away or we killed it. Yep. So now let's move to the one thing that you say business schools don't teach leaders, which I think is critical now more than ever as well. And that's humility. And this is an often misunderstood term. So I'd love for you to kind of give what you feel that it is, a definition around it, and maybe a few ways in which leaders can develop it. Well, I think humility is at its basic, at least from an organizational standpoint, is recognizing that you don't have all the answers. And, but with looking to the team, you can find the answers. It's also being vulnerable, showing one's humanity. And actually, that's a sign of strength. In a way, you're letting your guard down, which is something we're not taught to do. But when you do it, um, you reveal the humanity within. 
And I think that attracts people rather than repels them because you're being more open and honest. So at the same time, you're not a namby-pamby and crying at the, you know, chicken a little, but you're saying this is troublesome. You know, this is a challenge. Uh, we're facing tough odds, but I believe in you, uh, you, our team, we can figure this out. But you're also that person that is accessible. You're experiencing a crisis and you're not afraid to show your humanity, I think. And then, as I said, you know, we're all frail creatures, but we're not fragile. We, you know, we, we're resilient. Well, and humility is a virtue that's, there's nothing soft or squishy, like you say, about it. It's forged in adversity and gives us a backbone to really continue that journey. Without question, you know, and it makes us more approachable. Um, a humble person is one you would like to be around because, if anything, they're not always talking about themselves. They're talking about you and, and others around them. They're not self humility and self centeredness uh, don't go hand in hand. And, and we like to be around people who recognize uh, others around them. And actually, they're very self-aware as well of their of their strengths and shortcomings. You quote Thomas Merton, which I love, is that pride makes us artificial, but humility makes us real. Yes. And, you know, I think the denying one's humility is you're shorting yourself the ability to seek help and seek counsel, but also seek strength from others because we're not in this alone, you know, especially in an organizational framework. You're always working with other people and a leader who is not afraid to show her true self, authentic self, uh, being vulnerable is one that engenders a kind of respect, I would think, but also that that's a real person. And I like to be around. I want to be led by a real person. I completely agree with you. Next is really looking at making sure that leaders during this time have the right perspective. Because if you don't have a larger perspective, it's too often you can get distracted and annoyed when the little things don't go our way. But if you take a larger focus or take a step back and say in five years and 10 years, am I even going to remember this? Is this really going to impact me? And look more at it from a from a standpoint of gratitude and and trying to understand and recognize how how fortunate we we, we actually are. Right. And so many, I mean, I, I'm a perfect example of this because I can get irritated by customer service people. And I, I don't even remember being mad at them a month ago and who cares and doesn't affect my life at all. But that sense of, of gaining perspective, taking the long view, very easy to say. I think it gets down to the sense of mindfulness, which is perspective, as what are we really here for? Being fully present, being engaged with others. What really matters? Where do I need to uh, insert myself? How do I insert myself from a, as a leader? How do I become engaged with others? Is that the right thing to do and why? Asking these questions sets up a framework for how you can act really strategically and then tactically. What are the tactics we need to employ to achieve our intentions and our strategies. You're right. I mean, we must put life into perspective and it makes us easier to not get annoyed with those minor inconveniences. The next big thing or the next trait that really leaders need to differentiate or to have is happiness versus joy and have more joy. And, and you have a great example in the book too. Donuts make us happy, but they don't make us more joyful. Can you give us some more understanding around why that's the case, because I would argue that they may, they may not be the case for a few of us. Oh, well, I love donuts. Uh, and there's a little donut shop around the corner from me. And every time uh, I walk in there, I, I always tell the woman behind the counter, I wish you weren't here. <laughs> and not as a person, but she always laughs because she knows exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying about a jelly donut being um, gives us happy. It's this rush of, you know, sa satisfaction and sweet. And it gives a smile on her face or whatever. But that's not sustainable. <laughs> even, even if you eat a dozen of them. It's not sustainable, and nor is it healthy. And so I, I'm saying, I think joy is the better concept. Joy is the sense of enrichment. It comes from the meaning in life. And a lot of people want, use the term, it is part of happiness. I'm not going to argue with that, um, if you want to call it that. But joy or happiness is the sense of 
what is sustainable? It is our family, it is our friends, it is the meaning and the purpose of our lives and how we get joy from it, pleasure from it, enrichment from it. And it's important. I mean, part of that is something for me is, is having good hobbies, friends, commune with family, all of those things, taking on one sense of responsibilities, acting for the greater good, all of that, that's a joyful life. You can sprinkle it with some jelly donuts along the way. I will definitely do that because deep joy really comes from that pursuit of doing something more. And and really what you say, which I which I completely agree with here is joy that sustains us is the joy that comes from giving, being a part of something bigger than yourself, helping others with their life, becoming better versions of themselves or making the world a better place. And, you know, so often, and, and so many others have talk, talked about this, it's, it's giving back and it's giving back in the way that you can give back. I mean, if you can stroke a check for a million dollars, fine, bless you, great, okay? But most of us cannot. But sometimes it's basically, it's acting with a sense of intended kindness. Not so what we talk about random acts of kindness, intended acts of kindness. So what could that be? A smile, a laugh, a joke, a pat on the back, uh, being there when someone's going through a crisis, the tap on the shoulder, the hug when appropriate. Those cost nothing. It's the outward expression that uh, I care. That's compassion, showing that you care for the other person. I think we have time for one more. We don't have time to unpack all of these great qualities that leaders need now more than ever to show grace under pressure. But the one I'd like to end with is hope. And you mentioned that hope is not an excuse for inaction. No, hope is that sense that we all need it because it's it's focused on the future in a sense of a better tomorrow. But that better tomorrow isn't going to happen unless we act on it. And so hoping that you uh, uh, have a better golf game isn't going to happen unless you go hit balls a lot and play a lot. OK, that's a simple thing. So hoping that you'll have a better relationship isn't going to happen unless you invest yourself in the time. Hoping to be a better boss isn't going to happen unless you learn to listen and to delegate and to listen and listen and observe and all of these things. It's a generative process. I think hope begets hope, but false hope can be very destructive because it's it sets expectations which are unrealized. So hope must be, I think, grounded in reality, um, like hoping that you're going to win the lottery. Well, first you got to buy a ticket, <laughs> but, but you know, it, the odds are not really going to, you know, not in your favor, let's put it that way, but work doing your best, seeking, you know, to improve your condition, changing jobs if you have to, or finding different ways, but also channeling a better life for you. Even if your job isn't the ideal, what are you living for? Oh, I'm providing for my family. I'm creating a better tomorrow for my children or for my community. That's all uh, purposeful. And that leads to a sense of hope too. So it's, it's a topic that is worth it, but we have to guard our sense against false hope, which is based in unrealistic expectations, which is so often fa fostered by fantasy. You know, it's okay to have a fantasy, but it's, it's got to be tempered with more reality. Oh, you're right. And and you list some ways that leaders can 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 address this so that it's um it gives their employees hope. It's you know, to be real with them, to be positive, and also to be persistent, right? Uh, without question. And and I think that's the most important thing is to it's as I said, we said earlier about communication, is staying on message. It's again and again iterating the message or communicating the message verbally and non-verbally. And the nonverbal part is very often sometimes the more important because you're there. Be available to to help. And you define what it means to help. Well, thank you, John, for joining me today. I really appreciated our conversation. I know our listeners will get a lot out of it. Your new book, Grace Under Pressure, comes out on April 25th. But remind our listeners how they can get that book and how they can connect with you. Well, the, the best single source for me is my website, johnbaldoni.com. Imagine that. The book is available wherever fine books are sold uh, and you can order it. Or, you, of course, you can get it on Amazon. And should you order it from Amazon, feel free to leave a review. At this, I always like to 
to tease my author friends when a book comes out or about to come back. We authors turn into beggars. So please, please, please. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into this topic and all the tips and tools that were shared. If you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to share with others and post about it on social media. As always, you can head over to my LinkedIn page where you can see all the latest articles and posts from me. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which has video recordings of all the episodes of this podcast, along with bite-sized segments called single servings that are designed to answer your most pressing leadership and management questions. I look forward to serving you in the next episode, so hit subscribe and I'll see you then. Remember, until next time, it's not what you know that counts, but what you do consistently that makes a difference.